Good morning, ladies. If you could all find a seat, that would be fantastic. <laughs> Gals in the back, you little chitty chatters. If you guys can grab a place, that'd be awesome. <laughs> My husband always says it's like herding cats when you deal with ladies. <laughs> or children. We haven't advanced very much. <laughs> Nothing like being with girlfriends. Anyways, good morning, my lovely ladies of Abide. It's really nice to be here today. I actually thought I would start today with a math lesson. We, oh, well, we obviously have some math le lovers. In my world, this would be ironic because math and I are not friends. It's not in my genes. Yeah, my sister can attest to that. In fact, at the end of my sophomore year in school, in high school, my math teacher calculated my geometry grade to be 79.5%. 79.5%. And I begged, I begged Mr. Wayrock to please, please bump it up to a B. Because if I don't get a B, my dad's going to make me retake the class. And Mr. Wayrock said, there is no way your dad will make you retake the class because a C plus is a passing grade. And I said, oh, nay, nay. <laughs> you do not know my father. So because Mr. Wayrock has no grace, and because my dad was a stickler for grades, I got to spend the first eight weeks of my summer biking from Harborview Homes, which you gals now call the Port Streets, all the way down to Colonel Mar High School at 7 a.m. on my 10-speed bike to retake geometry. <laughs> Thus the reason I do not like math. <laughs> so with that in mind, I was struck by the comment John the Baptist made in the connecting passage, and this is where I'm hoping y'all read the connecting passage, in John 3.30. Now remember, at that point in time, John the Baptist had gained an element of notoriety and fame. Everyone knew about him in the region. And when he was being asked and questioned about this Jesus who was essentially moving in on his territory, who was starting to baptize his response was splendid to me. It was so clear and it was so concise. It was actually quite magnificent. John the Baptist said of Jesus, he must become greater. I must become less. And I found that really interesting that John the Baptist was so clear on what his role was and who he was in service to. He was there to serve Jesus and his God. He was the forerunner to Jesus. He was the introduction to the Savior. John the Baptist was not the guy, and he knew it. In fact, when John heard the bridegroom's voice, when he heard Jesus' voice, his joy was complete. And I thought that's really interesting because most of the time we want to be the guy. Our world tells us that we want to be first, we want to be the best, we want to be on top. No one is ever saying, I must become less. Tony Robbins says we need to release our inner giant. Louise Hay says the power is within us. Kendall Meyer says, unleash your greatness. And this is my favorite. Whitney Houston sang, the greatest love of all. You're now realizing why I don't sing up here on Sundays. The greatest love of all is me. Do you remember that song? Awesome. Anyways, but come on, really? The greatest love of all is me? Or what do our Instagrams say? We do a great job self-promoting about how fabulous our lives are when we stand picture perfect and we put it online. This much I know. If I fill up my life with me, my, and mine, 
with all my accomplishments, my stuff, and all of my fabulousness, there's not a lot of room for God. So let's go back to the math lesson I was talking about. Can any, I was hoping Nancy May was here because her husband's a math teacher, Colonel Mark. Does anyone know what this sign is? What is it? It's the alligator mouth, but it, yes, thank you. She, she was gifted in math too, that was my sister. This is the less than sign. So, if we are to have the same posture as John the Baptist, me should be less than God. Not me equal to God. We're getting very primary here, people, but this is where my mind works. Not me greater than God, but me less than God. This is the posture in which we should stand. So here's something I'd like you to consider this week. Do my actions, my Instagram, my choices, my work life, my social life, my thought life, my life life, reflect that posture, me less than God? If so, thus endeth the lesson, and my dad would be pleased. <laughs> if not, I suggest we all get back to math class. <laughs> so that's my two cents with, I don't know how Mr. Wayrock would feel about it, but I do hope that we can stand in a posture of me less than God. So I wanna welcome you all here this morning. I am super excited. We have our own Phyllis Hamilton, who's gonna share her spotlight this morning. So Phyllis, where are you? If you'll come on up. to move my math props. Well, uh, we have something in common. I also am uh, not a math whiz, which is why I taught second grade and not <laughs> higher grades and married an accountant, fortunately. <laughs> so good morning. So I'm gonna talk about my abandonment issues. Synonyms for abandonment are desertion, neglect, betrayal and rejection. I went to a small liberal arts college in Portland after growing up in Reno, and two weeks after my parents dropped me off for my freshman year of college, I got a phone call telling me that my mother had died suddenly. And I had a wonderful mother, and that was a great loss in my life. And though I knew my life would be forever changed in my naivety and the Lord's mercy, I had no idea about what that was going to mean for my future. I thought that I was pretty much grown up and that I was lucky that I had my mom for as many years as I did. And although that was partially true, um, now that I've walked with my own children through their lives from the, uh, the years 18 on, I realize uh, more what that loss means and meant for my life and um, the future effects that would have on me. And while my mother didn't choose to leave me, uh, she was permanently gone from my life. Since my dad was relatively young when my mom died, I always wanted him to marry again, which he eventually did. Before he married, the women that he eventually did marry, sorry, I cannot refer to her as my stepmother, um, led us to believe that she wanted to be part of our family. But that turned out not to be the case. It very quickly became apparent that she did not uh, plan to share my dad. So I had already lost my mother, and at that point, I effectively lost my father as well. At first, I blamed her, and, but eventually, I realized, you know, he let that happen, and feeling betrayed and rejected was the result of that. My husband Dave and I moved from Portland to Orange County when he became the CFO of an organization that 
supports the persecuted church. And he began traveling to their various spaces around the world, taking care of their financial um, accountability. So over the next 25 years, he took well over 100 trips to all parts of the world. And in the last years of his travel, there was email and Skype, which was still a challenge with the time differences and um, unreliable technology in the third world, but it helped us stay connected. But for most of the years, he was just gone from our lives uh, for 10 days to three weeks at a time. And the kids and I had to adjust to his coming and going and the challenges that occurred in his absence. Little things like um, clogged toilet when somebody decided to flush a Fisher Price boat with a Lego man in it. <laughs> <laughs> the Lego man was gone, the Fisher Price boat remained. Um, or big things like a miscarriage. And while I was grateful for God's care in the midst of the challenges, I did struggle with abandonment as I watched Dave pack his suitcase and once again leave home. And of course he did not abandon me and like some of you who've lost husbands, um, to death or divorce, but being left alone so often did have a similar effect on me. So where was God in my feelings of abandonment? The antonym of abandonment is adoption. Adoption's the act of leaving one's natural family and entering into the privileges and responsibilities of another. Simply put, we have a new family and through salvation, we're born into God's family. In my new family, my Abba Father never leaves me, he never abandons me, and he always brings good in the midst of my life challenges. And I also have a new spiritual family, the community of faith. In college, I found a fellowship group where my faith grew, matured, and sustained me, and the people from that group um, are still my closest friends uh, today. God knew what he was doing when he sent me, where I could grow in him and be supported by his body. And during the years of Dave's travel, we developed relationships with brothers and sisters all over the world and heard amazing stories of what God was doing in the face of persecution. And I was able to take some trips with Dave, which um, helped me to keep a perspective on the things that are really, truly important, not always easy to do where we live here in Orange County. So I'm grateful for God's hand, his loving hand sustaining me during the challenging times, and very thankful for our Orange County family of faith who lovingly stepped in and supported me during Dave's many absences. God's heart for adoption is all over scripture. His grace has purchased my adoption and yours. And all of our stories are being woven together into the ultimate story of redemption. It's a thread that binds all of us together into God's beautiful worldwide family of faith. I just want to thank you for sharing your story. And it is an amazing one. And I think when you've been a mom, yeah. that's when you really understand the love of a mom and what the love your mama must have had for you. So it's hard to understand the journeys we go on. Do you mind if I pray for you? Yeah. Father God, we are thank you, thankful for Phyllis. Uh, we're thankful for her story, even though there are hard parts and there's our loss in it and there is loneliness in it. And yet you faithfully met her, Lord, at so many points in her journey, God. And um, I just am thankful for the mama and the woman she grew up to be and that she was able to meet those needs with her own young adult children as they have grown up. Father God, I pray your hand on her, on her family as she uh, moves through the rest of her life, Lord. 
Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. But most importantly, thank you for adopting Phyllis because she has family with you. Amen. Thank you for sharing. And again, I don't know if we've filled all our spotlights yet, but it sure is really special and encouraging uh, to hear from you ladies. So if you haven't done so yet, uh, <laughs> I'm winking over my girlfriends over there <laughs> and my sister. Um, no pressure. Uh, I think it's actually just really sweet to sign up because we love, we love hearing from you ladies. Anyways, today's passage is John 4, 1 through 26, and our most wonderful Christina is going to be teaching on it. Uh, I'm not going to read the whole of it, but she did want me to read the, the main part of it because it is such critical scripture. So if you'll be a little patient with me, I'm going to start at uh, verse 4 and go through 26. Uh, if you want to, you can turn to your book, uh, page 77. So now he had to go through Samaria. So he came to, why am I saying so? Because it says so. Okay, sorry. Well, so he came to a town in Samaria called Sakar, near the plot of ground Jacob, Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. And Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with. The well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I don't, won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. He told her, Go call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is you have five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors, ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where you must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship that you do not know. We worship what we do know. For salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in the spirit of and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in the spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. And Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. Will you bow with me in prayer? Father God, we are grateful for this encounter at the well, Lord. We are grateful for the kindness and grace you extended to this woman. And in your proclamation of truth that you are the Messiah, Lord. But he sat with her in love and kindness and grace. He knew her 
to welcome her into the kingdom, Lord. We are grateful for the story, and we are eager to hear what you have put on Christina's heart today. Amen. If you will, before Christina comes up, we are going to listen to Living Water by Shane and Shane. Well, good morning. Let me pray. Father, that is our prayer, that song. Lord, we ask that you would saturate our souls with your living water. We pray that you would speak to us this morning. We love you, and we thank you for this interaction you had with this Samaritan woman, and ask that you would just shape our hearts by it. And we pray this in your name. Amen. Well, good morning. It's good to be with you guys. And I just have to say, I am so grateful for all of the teachers. Have they not been amazing? I am six of actually seven. You will get Linda Patton next week. So we're just mixing it up, and it's been so good. But I, they have all been so fantastic, and i am just been super grateful and super excited to open up this passage together this morning. But before I do, I just want to share a little story. When Drake and I were about four years married in 2000, we decided to do a hike into the Grand Canyon with my brother and his wife. And we were going to be camping down there, so we had to back pack in with all of our stuff. I had never done this before. And it's a 10-mile hike. Um, and it's 10 miles with a 40-pound or more backpack, right? And uh, so, you know, you have the switchbacks and everything. And I will say that it became one of the most intense experiences I had had. And one of the reasons being that I, we actually, because you're hiking in with everything you need for that hike, we ran out of water. And uh, it was about probably eight miles in where we ran out of water. And I remember that I became the most thirsty I had ever been in my life. And all of us were. And I remember this was such a hard hike that my husband's backpack, because it sits on your hips when you're carrying a big backpack like that, it was literally digging into his hips and it was bleeding. So this is like, there's an intensity to what's happening. So we've run out of water, we're injured, um, and I remember then we're probably at mile nine, so a mile to go, and my brother actually passed out from not having enough water. We were totally dehydrated, totally exhausted. And I remember in that moment, I experienced thirst in a way I never had before. It's all I could think about. It's all I wanted. I just wanted water. I just wanted to drink. I just, just wanted to quench the thirst that I had. And then I remember when we came around the corner on mile 10, we actually got to our spot. And this is what we saw. And it was like, this is Havasupai Falls. And it was like this intense moment of, I just wanted to literally just jump into that water. I wanted to, to drink it all. I just wanted to be in that water. I wanted to be fully engulfed in the water. I wanted to be saturated by the water. I was so, so thirsty, and so were the rest of us. Now, obviously, this was, probably wasn't the best water to drink, but we won't go into that, but it was this amazing picture of what I was longing for, and it was like flowing abundantly, and I just couldn't wait to experience it, and I think what we're talking about today is this. We know that water is this vital life source, right? We know that we need water to live. Um, and we have this iconic count encounter with Jesus in this passage. It's a well-known passage for good reason. Um, but I want to just remind you, as we look at these passages about Jesus, we want to experience him anew. We don't want to just step into it with the knowledge we already have. We want to step into it with fresh eyes to see who he is in a new way. And I will say what's cool about this particular encounter is that it is the longest recorded encounter Jesus has with somebody in the Gospel of John. So there was a real note to take real care to share this entire story. 
And so we're going to be looking at this living water. Thank you for the black slide. See, you guys are so good. I love it. Thanks. Um, We're going to be looking at this living water that breaks barriers. This living water that breaks barriers. Or in the song it says, break down the levees. Um, So to give a little background on this passage is the Samaria. We need to understand Samaria, okay? In 722 BC, the Assyrians had captured Samaria, which was Jewish, a Jewish country. Um, and the Israelites then were deported from Samaria, okay? So the Assyrians took over. However, there were some Israelites that remained. And those, inter- and those Israelites intermarried with the Assyrians, with these foreigners, okay? And so the Samarians, the Samaritans were considered these children of political rebels, right? They had captured this area, and they were the children of these, of these rebels, and they were considered racially half-Jewish, right? Um, and they created, in that process, they created their own form of religion that kind of took Jewish, Jewish tradition and didn't in other ways. And so they had created their, they were adhering to some Jewish customs, but definitely not all. And so the Jews considered the Samaritans to be ethnically unclean, They were racially impure, and that mattered back then, and they were religiously heretical, okay? And if you think about the Jewish people at that time, that would be gnarly, okay? So what's beautiful is we have this passage begin with it saying Jesus had to go through Samaria, and that's really important to point out because the Jews would never travel through Samaria. That would never be their choice. And it says Jesus had to go to Samaria. Why? Because he had an encounter that was going to be so important to the, pre- to the presentation of the gospel. And it's incredible who he, was, it was, who he was going to use. So it was very intentional. Jesus was actually pursuing this woman at the well. He was going after her. And he was also pursuing the Samaritan people. So let's jump into this passage. And what I want to say is it's actually this progression of an unveiling of the Messiah. This interaction with the woman at the well is Jesus unveiling who he is. And we see it in a progression. So first we see in the passage that Jesus is a rebel Jew, all right? Um, I threw the word rebel in there and I was like, I don't know, I hope that fits. But it feels like he's a rebel Jew, okay? Jesus is living water. And then we see in the progression, okay, we realize Jesus is a prophet. And then after that, we see, oh, Jesus is the temple, which Stephanie already talked about. And then lastly, we see Jesus is the savior of the world. And what he's doing in this this interaction is he's slowly revealing who he is. And we're going to see how profound this is. So let's start with this. Jesus is a rebel Jew. Our story begins, Jesus is tired, which I love that it says he's tired because it expresses his humanity. He was tired, and it's noon. And it's notable to say that it's noon because that was the heat of the day. It was the least likely time somebody would want to travel to the well because they would not want to be in the heat of the day. So we can infer from that. And women generally didn't travel alone to the well. It was usually a group of women that would go together in the morning to draw the water for the day. So we can infer from this that that she was actually, um, this woman uh, was avoiding social interaction. And she was going in the heat of the day at noon. So then she comes up and Jesus asks, will you give me a drink? And she basically says, what the heck? (laughs) Like, what? Um, You're a Jew. I'm a Samaritan. And I'm a woman. Uh, And so basically, why are you even talking to me, much less asking me for a drink? So we see that she's already realizing, whoa, this is a Jew like no Jew I have ever experienced before, right? And Jews don't associate with Samaritans, period. Like, to the point where it would actually be considered to defile, a Jew would be defiled by interacting with a Samaritan. Okay, so we'll get into that a little bit more. But there were these massive, deep, massive barriers of separation. Uh, There were national animosities, again, of race, religion, and ethics. Samaritans were despised by the Jews. 
truly despised. They were a despised people group. They were called half-bloods, which is so awful. Um, they, were barbar- they were considered barbaric. They were considered heretical. They were considered impure. They were even considered dangerous, right? So we have to take this in the context of Jesus is pursuing an interaction with this woman who is a Samaritan, and this is so already countercultural to anything anybody would have done at this time. And then we have to note that she is a woman. And it's important to note this because women in that day in society were demeaned and disregarded. Rabbis, in fact, were forbade to greet women in public. They weren't allowed to. In fact, I found this quote. I hope I actually put it in a slide. Nope, I did not. Shoot. Okay. Um, Kent Hughes says, some Pharisees were even called the bruised and bleeding Pharisees because when they'd see a woman in public, they'd cover their eyes and therefore bump into walls and houses as they walked about so trying to avoid any kind of interaction with a woman, right? And these were the rabbis, right? So women were not valued. Uh, And we later learned that this particular woman has five husbands and is shacking up with her boyfriend, so she would be an especially shameful woman, one for every person, every Jew to avoid, um, and even people in her society. She was an outcast. In fact, she would be considered kind of the lowest of the low. But not only did Jesus speak to her, he actually asked to drink from her jug of water. This crosses every possible boundary you could imagine. Um, He was so saying, he was basically saying, I am happy to defile myself with this interaction we're having. And she's going, what in the world is happening right now? Um, And we see that Jesus was more than willing to cross every social boundary, every barrier that existed for the sake of the gospel and for the sake of love. Um, And Jesus, this interaction, I think when you see the disciples later going, why were you talking to her? They're thinking, why did you defile yourself? Why did you make yourself impure? Why are you doing such a shameful thing? Um, And Jesus, we see throughout scripture, he is not bound by social norms at all. He destroyed barriers. In Galatians 3.28, it says, There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. We know that there were still Jews and Gentiles, males and females. Well, that's getting iffy nowadays. But um, <laughs> slaves, <laughs> I actually didn't intend to say that, so I'm sorry if that's offensive. Um, there, <laughs> there are Jews, Gentiles. We know that there are slaves. We know that there are people who are free. We know that there are male and female. So what Christ is saying is he crossed every bound, boundary, every barrier to make us all, we are all valuable in the same way in his eyes. He wanted to create a one people. He values all of us. And so it's not that he's saying those things don't exist. He's saying that those don't, he doesn't have those barriers that everybody else has. His love extends to all in the same way. So this was a radical, radical interaction. It smashed the walls of social norms. And he did it for the sake of the gospel, for the sake of love, declaring that Jesus was, he was for all nations and all people. And then we go on to see that he is living water. The story continues. Jesus turns the table on her and he says, well, actually, if you knew who I am, you'd ask me for a drink. I'll give you living water. I'll give you living water. Let me say it that way. And then she responds, what in the world? You don't have a jug? Where would you get this water? You think you'd be better than Jacob who made this well? How is that possible? And Jesus replies, you'll be thirsty again with your water but not with the water I'm offering. It will be a spring of water in you. And she's like, sure, count me in. I don't want to keep coming to this well in shame every, every day. And so we see that Jesus says, I am the living water. But he's talking about a spiritual heavenly truth, and she's taking it as a, she's stuck in a literal earthly understanding. 
And what's interesting is this is the same with Nicodemus, as Joy talked about last week. Not understanding the spiritual implications of what Jesus is saying. And Jesus, in this moment, he's exposing her need. He's exposing her thirst, but he's not exposing her earthly need and thirst. He's exposing her spiritual need and thirst. And he knew that she didn't want to be thirsty. He knew that she didn't want to keep coming shamefully to that well, but he was going to offer her something that was far greater than what she knew she needed and that would speak to those things as well. Um, she was drinking of natural wells where she would thirst again. And then this word living water, I'm going to, this word living water, it actually meant in that time, if that was used, it meant flowing water in that society. So it was a regular phrase that they used for a water that was a running water like this, where it was a steady stream or river, where it's not a pool or a well that was stagnant, but it was expected to be kind of fresh and clean in a way that those that well water wouldn't have been. So it wasn't a foreign term to her when he says living water. She would have understood it as to, oh, this is a fresher water. This is a cleaner water, right? This is something I would want even more of, and then it, it's uh, an unending supply of water. But again, we know that he was offering her spiritual living water, um, a steady stream to meet her actual deep need, not her perceived need, her actual deep need. And really, he was offering himself, revealing he's what she needs, and that's what this does. And then nothing else was going to satisfy that. Nothing else was going to satisfy her longings. And we see in this passage that the water Jesus gives is a gift of God. It's alive. It fully satisfies. It's an abundant stream, never drying, drying up. And it's not that one drink is enough. That's not what it means by the abundance. It's that we can keep drinking from that well. It's continually something we can drink from. And it gives eternal life. In John 7, 37, it says, If a man is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me... As the scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from within. He's saying if you're thirsty, if you experience need, what you need is me. What you need is me. I'm the living water you need. And then we go on. He moves from that progression to express he's a prophet. Jesus is a prophet. Now we learn that she's actually trying, trying to quench her thirst this is where we learn that she's trying to quench this thirst she has, the spiritual thirst she has, with companionship and sexual intimacy. That's how this woman has been trying to quench that thirst. So the story continues. Jesus says, go get your hubby. And she says, I don't have one. And he says, true dat. You've had, you've had five and you're shacking up with a guy right now. And she's like, whoa, you must be a prophet, right? Jesus is a prophet, and so much more, which we'll see. But a prophet in that time was considered to have intuitive gifts. And Jesus was showing that he had special insight into her life. And he was also exposing her sin. And by exposing her sin, he was exposing that need that he's wanting to meet. So he's exposing her sin, but he's doing it in love. He's doing it in care. He's doing it in compassion. Jesus is showing that he sees her. And he knows all about her, and yet he loves and forgives her. And he is what she needs. But he wasn't just a prophet, which some still claim about Jesus. He was more than that. He also, as he shares, Jesus is the temple. So feeling naked and exposed, this woman, she immediately shifts gears. She's like, well, I'm feeling really exposed right now, so let's just shift to something else. Um, and so she the story continues where she states, you clearly have spiritual insight, but we Samaritans, we worship here on this mountain, and you Jews are telling us that we need to worship at the temple in Jerusalem. And Jesus declares to her, worship isn't going to be about a place. Now is the time when those who truly want to worship the Father will do so in spirit and truth. 
And in this passage, we basically see that Jesus is declaring he's the temple. She's looking for the place, the temple, and he's saying, I'm the person, the temple, which again, Steph had talked about two weeks ago. Worship was to no longer be about a place, which it had been for so many years. So this would be earth shattering because people went to the temple to meet with Jesus. I mean, to meet with God. Jesus is saying, I am the temple. Worship is about me. Movement from place to person. Your worship isn't going to be out of place. It's going to be about a person. And it's not about, so it's not about the where. It becomes about the who and the how. And so he explains just briefly the who. Worshiping in truth. We see that's pretty plain to see that worshiping in truth is worshiping Jesus. Truth is plain. It centers on the work and the person of Christ. That is the truth. That he is the truth. And we see that declared throughout scripture. He is the truth. We're worshiping him. And then the how is worshiping in spirit. So what does this mean? God's spirit is at work in our spirit when we know Jesus. His spirit is at work in us. And it's about being born of the spirit, which Joy just beautifully shared about last week with the story of Nicodemus. That we worship as we are born of the spirit, we worship out of that. Our spirit is is made alive by the spirit of God, and the Holy Spirit ignites and energizes our spirit for worship. When he energizes and ignites us, it can't help but flow into praise and worship because we have so tasted of him. So true worship, he's saying, isn't about a place. It's about the heart. It's about worshiping in spirit and truth. So then we move to this last amazing declaration that Jesus is the savior of the world. And so the story continues. She says, I know the Messiah is coming. He'll explain all of this because you're really confusing me. Um, And Jesus declares, no, no, no. The wait is over. I'm the Messiah. I'm the one you're looking for. I'm the Savior of the world. Jesus is saying, I am the Messiah. I'm the one you've been waiting for. I'm the one who will reveal all things. I'm him. Matthew 16, 13 through 16 says, Jesus said, who do you people say the son of man is? And they replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. He's declaring to her that he is the Messiah. He's the one she's been waiting for, and he's so much more than a prophet. He is the son of the living God. Now, what is so noteworthy is this is the first time Jesus had declared that he was the Messiah. And I want you to just think for a moment about who he is declaring this to. The very first time Jesus claims, I am the Messiah, he declares it to a Samaritan woman, the lowest of the low. And he says to her, I'm the anointed one. I'm the promised one. I will be the great deliverer. I'm the Jewish king who will save the nation, but definitely not in the way that they expected. Um, He makes this claim to a Samaritan woman. He gives her the good news. And what's amazing is she then, with such energy and vigor, goes out and shares it with everybody she can. I love the picture. It's like she literally can't help, but she's bursting out. Like the living water is bursting out of her. She can't help but share it. It's so flowing from her. So we have this passage, and I just want to share two things, two things that I think have really stood out for me. I mean, there's so much here. I was like, I could go on and on and on, and I know you don't want me to. So (laughs) I'm going to point out a couple things. Jesus is a barrier breaker. He's a barrier breaker. He broke every taboo and first revealed himself to the lowest of the low, a Samaritan woman. He wants, to sub- he wants to absolutely destroy social barriers for the sake of the gospel. And on a side note, I want to say, 
as a, a study of women, that Jesus so clearly values women. I think we can sometimes look at scripture and go, am I valued as a woman? And Jesus was, was so redeeming her role as a woman. He was raising her to honor. He was redeeming her shame. And he uses a woman to first reveal who he is. That's profound. Jesus clearly values women in a society that didn't. And he's saying, you have honor in my kingdom. The rest of the world may not honor you. You have honor in my kingdom. And again, he is restoring her honor. And then we think about our current barriers. Um, we live in a world that currently has barriers that need to be broken down. And I feel like the church needs to be a place where that's happening. Because we serve a barrier-breaking God. Whether it be economic barriers, which if we're honest, they're probably more significant than we acknowledge. Racial barriers, social bar barriers. The church should not be a place of cultural barriers. It should be a place that breaks them down for the sake of the gospel. There is divine potential we have in every interaction we have with people, in every relationship. I think about this woman, I think her excitement to share the gospel, she's like, it doesn't matter, I just want to share it with whomever. Um, and we want to be people with that kind of enthusiasm, that we will break through whatever we need to, to share that gospel with people, to be the love that they are desperate for. Um, breaking barriers is part of God's heart. And if we as a Christian community are missing that, we're missing part of God's heart. And then the second thing is that Jesus talked about being this living water. And I think we are aware that we, every one of us, has a deep, dry well in our hearts. Every person. That we have this great need. We are thirsty. We are thirsty in the way that I was thirsty as I hiked the Grand Canyon. Like, we are thirsty in a way that, in a sense, it's all we can think about, but we try to not think about it. <laughs> we are thirsty people. But what's interesting is we still drink of natural wells, of worldly wells. We will thirst again, and we see that. We experience that when we th drink of these natural wells. We can never quench our thirst that way. The Samaritan, again, woman was trying to quench her thirst with companionship and sexual intimacy. But the reality is we all have ways, even as believers, that we're still trying to quench our thirst. Whether it be through materialism, achievement, power, entertainment, food, or companionship and sexual intimacy. And I think sometimes we can be like the sailor who has water available to him, but instead he drinks from the ocean and doesn't know it's killing him. And I think we can be the people that are drinking from something that's killing us. And yet we have living water available to us. Um, for me, as I sat with this, I really sat and I thought, what am I drinking of? And I realized that when I feel that tension in my soul, where I feel that need, what's actually happening is I'm trying to tell myself I'm not thirsty. So I want to numb that need. I don't want to be thirsty. <laughs> and so my, part of my numbing mechanism is to do something, to try to not sit with it, to not be in the quiet of my soul, to experience the thirst. That's one of the first things. And I shared last week another thing is I can, I can be somebody who wants to turn to something to entertain me or something that's fun because I don't want to feel that need and that thirst. Um, but what's happening is I'm turning to things that are like this, um, can you go back, like this well, when I have, uh, no, and then now back, when I have this flowing water that's available to me. Um, these things that we do, these longings that we have, this dissatisfaction, I think if we're honest with ourselves, we're trying to regularly, even as believers, quench that thirst with other things. And I think Jesus is saying, 
I want to be what fills you. I want to be the living water in your life. You have a deep need. You've acknowledged your deep need if you've said that you're, if you've declared that you want to be mine, that you have faith in me. Um, you've said you recognize that need, but then what's interesting is we take a drink of the well, or of the, not of the well, of the living water. We take a drink, and then we think we're good, and then we go back and drink from the, the well. <laughs> and what he's saying is, I want you to continuously drink of me, constantly drink of me. Take in the Holy Spirit in your life. Acknowledge the Holy Spirit. Recognize the work he wants to do. Drink of me. Drink him in. Jesus is saying, come to me, drink my living water. And when you do, you will be satisfied. And what's so fascinating to me is I think we actually do experience that deep satisfaction of drinking from living water. And yet, how is it we still go to that stale old well? And so he's saying you will be completely satisfied. And he's also saying you will be permanently satisfied. Now, that doesn't mean that we will spiritually never thirst again because we all know we keep thirsting. The thirst is there. But what it does mean is he is offering us a never-ending supply of living water. It is within us. It's welling up in us. The spirit is in us. And it's this divine spring. It's bounding, jumping, flowing, deep, dancing fountain in our lives that we can drink from if we know Jesus. N.T. Wright says, if you want the running pure water bubbling up inside you that Jesus offers, you will have to get rid of the stale, moldy water you've been living off of all the time. And then Psalm 42 so beautifully expresses this thirst. As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? And then here's the invitation. Come all you who are thirsty, come to the waters. Let me pray. Father, we thank you that you have poured out your love on us, that you have broken down every barrier that we might know you, that we might have relationship with you. We thank you that you value us, you love us, you want to restore our honor, you want to redeem our lives from the pit. Father, I do ask that by your spirit we would drink you in, that we would taste regularly, moment by moment, of this flowing water, this boundless fountain that you offer within us and through your word and through prayer. Father, we ask that we would taste this water anew, that we would want to come to you and that you would protect us, even keep us from drinking from the moldy, stale waters we drink from. So, Father, we thank you that you are God who sees us, that you pursue us, that you want intimacy with us, and we pray that you would do this work this morning. We pray this in your name. Amen. Okay, so Christina, I know I'm supposed to like do the wrap up of that whole lesson and I think I have 10 pages of notes. So can I just say boom, drop the mic? <laughs> that was awesome. Um, I'd like to quickly thank uh, those of you who helped make this morning happen as always to our AV tech team. We had Janice, Maggie, Linda, and Julio. They're the reason you all can hear us. Um, I'd also like to thank Snack this week was Karina and Nancy's group. And coffee this week, which is, I won't say it's our living water, but it is a lifeline, people, was Sherry Fenley. So thank you so very much for that. Anyways, I hope you guys will enjoy your small groups. I am going to encourage you to grab your bagels or your yumminess quickly and get on to your small group time because uh, we don't want to cut that time short. Anyways, have a wonderful week all, and we'll see you next week. <laughs>